I'm Dennis Borosh and this is Games You Should Know By Heart. And actually, this game, you will not know the whole game because what we will try to grasp in this lesson is the heritage of Petrosian, the Tigran Petrosian's heritage, which is the positional rook sacrifice. Now, this position of rook sacrifice first popped up in the Zurich candidates when he played Rashevsky. So the Iron Tigran, as he was known, was under kind of some pressure. White played e4, and if, white, if black will be forced to take on e4, which he soon will be, he will lose all that grasp on these very important d5 and e5 squares. So Tigran, the Armenian world champion, starts to pile some pressure on the e4 pawn. Rook e8, queen f4, b5, bishop d1, rook e7, bishop g4, queen e8, e5, a5, rook e3. And now, Petrosian came up with a concept that we'll see in many, many recent games and actually was revolutionary. It's black to move and build a fairly unusual blockade that was very not, not very known at that time. Yes? Yes, rook, rook d8 first. Rook e1 and now rook e6. Yes, the idea of rook e6. The point is that black wants to stop white from expanding with the pawns. If the pawns start expanding, it's over. a4, and black continued with his plan. How can black continue with his blockading plan? Yeah. Rook d5, well, in general, black is not crazy about blockading with the rooks. He blockaded with the rook on e6 this time because it was necessary. But other pieces in chess love outposts. Yeah, so knight e7 was played by Petrosian as the knight is headed to d5. Bishop takes, it was forced, f takes. And now, this is kind of a weird situation. Black has uh, an, ex an exchange up position, but those black pieces are much more coordinated, so the position is actually not that bad for black. Queen f1, trying to run away from knight d5 ideas. Knight d5, rook f3, bishop d3, and White decides to give back the exchange. Takes, takes, b4, takes, takes, a5, rook a8, rook a1, queen c6, a, bishop c1, c7, a6. And basically, they reach a dynamically equal position, and they agree to a draw. Even they could go for the end game, because let's say queen takes a6, takes, rook takes, queen takes b2, and even though white is up a pawn, this knight on d5 just compensate for that pawn deficit. So <clears throat> this was a very impressive first off by Petrosian. Even the legendary Mihal Tal was impressed when he saw this while playing in the candidates tournament himself. But this was a start of a series of games which will be featuring this idea. Now, this is a game between Ulko and Morozevich. We know more about Morozevich, though. And in this position, he knew about the Petrosian sacrifice, and he uses it in this position with full effect. How did black continue in this position? This is kind of an unusual idea, because this is right after the opening. Usually sacrifices don't really happen that early. Black, how black can use a positional sacrifice or positional sacrificial idea in this position. Yeah. 
Yeah, we'll take C3, obvious. F takes C3. Yeah, we'll take C3, obvious. F takes C3. And now queen e7. And Morozevich's play will be in full principle Petrosian like play like what? <laughs> so this will this will definitely be uh, in the style of Petrosian, because he will try to occupy important squares for the exchange. And that was the basic idea of Petrosian's sacrifice. E4, how can we try to occupy the important dark squares? Yes? Well, we can only play one move. <laughs> well, you have to. Because, OK, knight h5. It's a fine move. Uh, Morozevich decided to play knight d7 first castle and now knight h5 so it's true it transposed but it does matter what you choose in the position so black is basically trying to take over all the black squares and it's in general a closed position which doesn't really favor rooks so how can we evaluate this position then roughly well you're saying that uh, white is slightly better. I'm not sure. White will be better if the position opens up and if white manages to open up the position. But if black will manage to close off all the lines for the rooks, black will be the one pushing for a win. But let's see how the game goes. Queen d2, knight e5, knight takes e5, bishop e5. And now we can see that this bishop on e5 is a real monster. It might help develop a decisive attack with queen h4 and queen g3. It might even help some knight jumps. On the other side, white only has a rook that can just move two squares but doesn't really do anything. So I'd even say we played just few moves, but Morzevich, his position improved dramatically. Knight e2, trying to cover up these vital squares on g3 and f4. Bishop d7, rook f3, trying to make use of the two rooks. Rook f8, rook f1, b6. Why did black play b6? Yes? To solidify the position. Yeah, to solidify the position and also against any potential queen sorties to queen a5. b3, knight f6, king h1, king g7. Black's position is very solid now because these two bishops are much, much more active than these two rooks. And they have potential in the long term. Where will black try to play in this position? On which side? Yeah. Yeah, so white is fairly defended on the queen side, but not as much on the king side, because the black squared bishop is, so, is really missing from the position. Queen e3, h5, queen f2, knight h7, hinting at knight g5, which can be annoying. Queen e3, h4, rook f2, knight f6. Where is that knight heading right now? Because this is a sudden turn of plans. Yeah. G3. G3, yes. Through knight h5 and g3. Rook f3, knight h5, queen f2, g5. And it's very, uh, very nice play by Morozevich, as he's not in a rush to play knight g3. What would happen if black would play knight g3 here? How can black counter this? I mean, how can white counter this? Yeah? So black just played knight g3 check. 
knight takes g3. Let's say h takes g3. How can white kind of consolidate his position? Any ideas? You can see that there's a lot of pressure on the h3 pawn. So sometimes we sacrifice for other reasons. Yeah, of course, rook takes g3. And yeah, and now the situation stabilized for white. It's not as bad as it was before. So it's important to remember that if you have material advantage, always think about the idea of giving it back for some positive results. For here, white actually equalizes after rook takes g3 ideas. g5, rook e3, f6. A nice little pawn chain by Morozevich as he gets ready to assault on the king side. Queen f3, rook h8, king g1, queen e8. Very nice maneuver, trying to bring the queen over to g6. Queen f2, queen g6. Rook f3, g4. Takes, bishop g4. Rook f5, bishop takes e2. And now this bishop takes e2 is a very strong move. Because obviously, white would be more than overjoyed if Morozevich would take on f5, because queen f5 and White has chances to survive here. But after bishop takes e2, there's no chance that this bishop on e5 will ever be opposed by any strong pieces. Queen takes e2, knight g3, queen f3, h3. So actually, Morozevich is not looking forward to take any of these rooks. He says, these rooks are not good enough for my pieces. I'd rather keep my light squid, my light pieces on the board. And actually, Y just realized how bad his position is, and he actually re resi resigned here. Because if G takes H3, then we just take the rook with check. And otherwise, the pawn will just promote, and black will just ignore those two rooks. And even if, let's say, White would take on E5, first off, we can play H2 check, but we can just stoically take back on E5 and we're still winning. So this was a very good display that sometimes light pieces are much stronger than the rooks in closed positions. And now I'm going to show more games that will show how strong these light pieces can be in these closed situations. So here's another position between um, Hungary is two very strong players. At one point, they were number one and number two, I think, in the Hungarian rankings. And <clears throat> Black is under some pressure, but Almashi finds a very good defensive idea here. It's Black to move and equalize. So we can see this position kind of resembles the key game, that Brzezewski petrosian game. So it's always good to look back at the greats, because they come up with great ideas, and you can use them later on in your own practice. The first game was played in Zurich in 1953, and this is 2003, as you can see. So that's how important it is to know the classics. So what is the strongest piece in White's position? The queen on g6. But actually, it's not the queen that is really that threatening. Which piece is the most threatening in this position? Can someone tell me which piece is the most aggressive piece in 
white's position. Any ideas which piece is the strongest? What? The knight. The knight. Yes, exactly, the knight. So if we located which piece is the strongest for white, what can we do about it? Yes? Uh, knight h4 with f4. Knight h4. Is there any tricks for white? No tricks, because the knight, if, let's say, white would play hazardously and take, take, knight g6, well, unfortunately, we can take with the knight, so it doesn't work. So queen g4. And now, as you correctly pointed out, rook takes f4, positional, exchange sacrifice happens. Bishop f4. And now, black is down material. So black needs to trade carefully now, but if he does, he can stabilize his situation. Let's take a look how can we stabilize this position for black. Obviously, the pawns that are on white squares are well defended by our bishop. So other pawns that are on dark squares are in bigger danger of being exposed. So we need to cover them first. How can we make sure we never get mated on g7? Yeah, knight f5, exactly. He played rook f8 first, but after that he played knight f5. But rook f8 was just to kind of destabilize this bishop on f4, here, and knight f5. Now, it might seem unreasonable that he plays knight h4, queen g4 takes on f4, rook f8, queen eight, rook h1, and knight f rook h1 and knight f5. So it might seem unreasonable that he sacrifices his own exchange and then he moves his piece back to f5. Well, the knight was so dangerous it was worth a rook. And this knight will be very stable here. The only way white could get rid of it if white sacrifices on f5. But that would be very dangerous as the h pawn is very weak. So it continued with bishop e3, bishop e8, f4, bishop f7, bishop f2, rook b8, queen h3, king h7, rook a2, bishop e8. And soon the players agreed to a draw because the g7 pawn is comfortably defended by the f5 knight and the b5 is protected by the bishop. And white cannot ever really double on the b pawn, let's say here, rook b2, then I just take on a3. So you can't really move all of your rooks to the b line. And if a4, then there is always this idea of b4, and there's always a big blockade by black. So in general, Black has a very nice blockade, a fortress, as you will. You, and he used this with the Petrosian technique, sacrificing the rook for good peace placement. All right, so let's see game number three. So this game was played between Areshenko and Vidit, Vidit who recently reached 2700. C5 takes takes, knight e7, castle, knight c6. This is the so-called Armenian variation or Laputian variation because this was often played by Laputian with very good results. Also Psakis, Lev Psakis played this line and made a lot of comments and good suggestions in these type of positions. Queen g4. Bishop d7, h4, rook f5, knight g5. In general, this is a defensive system for black. But if white gets too aggressive, he might run into trouble. Rook f8, hinting on rook takes f2. But white doesn't want none of that. h6, h5. 
between D8. Well, if H takes G6, oh, H takes G5, then H takes G6, and there's a naughty little mating idea that is set up by white. What is that mating idea? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, rook cage it, king takes, queen h5 and queen h7 mate. So h5, queen d8. So with it is making sure that most of his pieces are taking part in the defense. Otherwise, he can easily get checkmated in this line. Knight h3, g takes h5, queen g3. So white is willing to sacrifice a pawn just to open up the position. So in general, in, in these games and these type of French structures, white is trying to open up the position as much as possible, while bla black tries to keep it closed. h4, queen h2, knight e7, knight f4, and <clears throat> black comes up with a great move here. Yeah? Rook yeah, rook takes f4. I mean, he doesn't play rook f4 yet, but it's going to come very soon. Knight e2, knight g6. So I thought he could take, actually, right now on knight f5, and it would still work. But Vidit thought otherwise. Queen e8, knight e2, knight g6, f4, queen f7, rook f1, b5, rook f3, queen h7, g1. And now, <coughs> black's rook is trapped. But do we panic here? No. Not really, because we're willing to sacrifice that rook still. So what is the classical way of defending that? Yes. Knight e7, yes. So after king c1, bishop e8, eventually white takes on f5. And now we get the position very similar to the first one we saw between Leiko and Almashi, but with the difference that the king is on the queen side and the pawn was already taken on h5. So I would evaluate this position as slightly better for black, as white will have to face some attacking ideas later on. Bishop e1, trying to activate the bishop, but the main issue in these positions still haunts white as this bishop hits its own pawns on the whole position. It cannot really find any uh, targets. Bishop g6, queen d2, queen f7. Where is this bishop on g6 headed to? It's trying to find a very nice safe spot where it could hit the c2 pawn constantly. h7, yes, of course. Rook h3, king h8, bishop h4, bishop h7. A very clever idea, because after this, the queen will be free to maneuver around. King a2, rook b8. Notice that black is in no rush to move the queen of f7. He rather puts his rook on b8, signaling the idea of b4, but not yet deciding where he is going to put his queen. He might put his queen on a7 or even h5, but he doesn't want to decide yet. Rook b1, queen h5. That was the whole point. For example, if black plays queen a7, white could play rook b1, and there is no queen h5 idea. But after rook b8, rook b1, there is this queen h5 idea, pinning the rook on h3, and and mobilizing all those white pieces. Queen h2, queen e8 back, queen d2, b4. And now this was actually a huge tempo for black because the queen from e8 will hit this a4 square. c takes, queen a4. So black is getting ready to sacrifice some material to open up the position along the lines in front of the white king. B5, 
But White Arashenko, who's a 2700 player himself, doesn't want to open up the position at all. Knight takes h4, rook h4, bishop takes c2, rook b2, bishop b3, queen takes b5, f5. And now, Vidit finds a final decisive combination, which will wrap this game up. <coughs> Obviously, at the moment, White's position is okay-ish, but if the position opens up a little bit, White will be in big trouble. How can Black try to open up this position? Bishop c2 check runs into queen takes c2. Well, in order to have a decisive advantage in this position, we need to let our queen into the game. Queen a4, that's too slow. Yes? C3, yes. It's a big pawn sacrifice because um, if it fails, it fails badly. So white is forced to take because it's also a double attack. Queen f1 check. Queen c1, and here's a brilliant move played by black, which will decide the game. Which brilliant move does black play in this position? Now bishop c2, exactly. Very nice move by Vidit. The rook can't take it because it would be kind of illegal. The queen can't take it because it's illegal the same way. And what if I take on c2 with the king? What happens if I take with the king? Yeah, just rook c8 wins the queen and ends the game. So a very impressive play by Vidit, sacrificing the rook for the knight and just building up an attack. And Arashenko was basically just trying to defend, but eventually black broke through with this c3 idea and bishop c2 check. This is also the favorite line of Conrad Holt, the young, talented American player, and he played this against Charbonneau as well. c4 takes queen f7, so he played queen f7 instead of bishop d7, knight g5, bishop d7, queen e2, b5, g4, knight takes. Queen g6, knight f4, queen e4, f3, g5. And now the unsurprising rook takes f4 happens, bishop f4. And how does black continue here? Remember that black is trying to build a blockade somehow and then to maneuver around. And then he tries to maneuver around white's pieces. Yeah? g6 would lose to rook takes h6 this time. Well, if g6, rook takes queen g7, the white queen will move to h2, and black will have a long struggle after a long castle and rook h1. The problem is that as, as long as white has the h line, black runs into trouble. So black doesn't have the luxury to give away the h line. Exactly, bishop e8 will be played. First he played rook f8, but then bishop e8, and now h5, yes. <coughs> rook b1, knight e7, g6. 
This G6 move is a very nice move by White. It's better to sacrifice that pawn because uh, otherwise he'll have just a dead bishop on e3 staring at all his own pawns, which would render it rather useless. G6, queen takes G6. I guess White is kind of afraid of queen G3 ideas, so he plays queen F2, knight F5, rook G1, queen H7. Black's position is much, much preferable because he has all the chances to maneuver around. Meanwhile, White will have to guard both the queenside pawns on c3 and c2 and the pawn on f3. Bishop g5, h4. What's the idea of h4? Yeah, to allow the bishop to go to h5 and hit on f3. f4, b4. After <coughs> White decided to cut out his own bishop, Black decides it's due time for some action. So he plays b4, kind of undermining this d4 pawn. And after the pawns fell, White's p position automatically collapses. Takes, takes, queen d2, b3, takes, takes. And even though White managed to get away with um, these pawn, pawn breaks, this b pawn got really strong. Queen b2, bishop b5, queen takes b3, knight g3. What would happen if white would play queen takes b5? Yes? Yeah, queen c2 check. Yeah. Queen c2 check, king f3, queen takes h2, just like as it happened in the game. Rook g2, queen h3, king f2, knight e4, check, knight d2. And now there are too many decisive threats by black. Knight f3 check is coming, h3 is coming. So white was forced to take, but that's losing. Takes, takes, queen takes d4. Now and black now black's the one up the exchange correct, and black won the game. <clears throat> so last but not least, I want to show a game between Molnar and Tatev Abrahamian will start from this position. Obviously, this comes from the same Armenian variation, which Tatev is known to play for a long while. And she will show her skills in this position. g4. White obviously is trying to open up the position and try to mate. But He's confident and takes on h5. Queen takes h5, rook f8, putting pressure on the f3 pawn. f4, bishop e8, hinting on this nice little trick of rook takes f4. Queen h2. And how should black continue in this position? Obviously, Tatev built up a battery along and hitting on the f4 pawn, but she needs a little bit more firepower to actually crash through. Knight g6, exactly. Putting more pressure on the f4 pawn. Rook h1, and now she plays a very, very aggressive and good move. Knight takes f4 would be a little bit dubious because of queen takes h7 mate. So she didn't play that. <laughs> yes? h6, the simple h6. So Molnar was forced to play king e3. Well, if he would take here, she can just take back, takes, and rook sacrifice takes, rook takes f4, and because queen h7 is only a check, the king, let's say king e2, she can just take on c3 and black's attack is decisive. So Molnar decided to play king e3 instead, but now she crashes through with very energetic play. How did she continue? <clears throat> yeah. Knight takes f4. Knight takes f4, indeed. 
Knight f4 is ill-advised because queen takes c3, so bishop takes f4 was played. Rook takes f4. And Molnar decided to move his king to d2, but what happens if he'd ha have taken on f4? Queen c3, queen c3, king f2, yeah, king f3. Queen e5 would munch on a pawn, but we can continue with very nice energetic moves. And that would make our position very good. Yes? Yeah, g5. And even though g5 is very aggressive, it's very good in this position. As the rook will enter with rook takes f4 and it will be decisive. So rook f4, king d2. But even though he's trying to stabilize his position, she doesn't back down and just finds the biggest blow in this position. She finds the decisive blow in this position. How can we just shatter all, all of this pawn center built by Molnar? Yeah? Rook f2, what does white play? Uh, nothing. What, he, what does he play? Uh, maybe queen d3 or queen h4. Well, queen h4 wouldn't make much sense. If, if g3, then rook f3 happens. There's not much difference between queen h3 and g3 so queen g1 was played and now rook takes e2 correct and now her queen enters with decisive threats and we can see how disorganized all the white pieces are queen e3 Molnar tries to just get some synchronicity between the pieces but it's quite difficult queen takes c2 king e1 bishop g6 bringing more pieces to the attack Rook f1, takes, takes, bishop d3, check. King g1, bishop e4, queen f2. Do we really want to exchange in this position or not? No. With black, no, definitely not. So where should we bring our queen? Queen d3, that's a possibility. But if we can, we should try to win <coughs> tempies. If possible. Yeah, queen c3. That's what she played. Rook e1, queen h3. And Molnar resigned as if he would play queen h2. She'd take on g4. King f2, let's say. Check. c3. And either the pawn will just promote or she'll just mate white. So Molnar resigned. And Tatev showed how you can play this position with energetic play and how you can defend your position as well as bank on the counterplay in these types of positions. Yes? I think I mean, it is still exchange up for white, but he, he's at, yeah, he's kind of in deficit right now because she has way too many pawns and an aggressive bishop on e4. So that's basically Petrosian's heritage. And remember that in close positions, light pieces can often outweigh the rooks. And you can use them to full effect, like in this game and the game between Arashenko and Vidit. Thank you so much.